بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد after thanking and praising Allah the Mighty and the Most High for His countless blessings blessings of Islam the blessing of youth the blessing of good the blessing of brotherhood and sisterhood the blessing of an education the blessing of warmth when it's cold outside in which many Muslims and non-Muslims alike are suffering from as we speak many people are cold as we speak the blessings of having something warm to drink a warm beverage in which there are people as we speak who don't have a hot meal to eat the blessing of clothes the blessing of uh, things on your feet to keep your feet warm let alone stylish and comfortable etc countless blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, after thanking Allah for these blessings I thank um, the MSA here the brothers and the sisters or the sisters and the brothers who are in charge of um, inviting us and taking care of us and arranging the meeting I thank all of the attendees Muslim and if there are any non-Muslims who are listening the brothers and sisters for listening and for sacrificing the precious and scarce time of a college student the precious and scarce time of a college student in which you have to study you're working you have your sports you have your recreation you have so many things to prepare for to review to plan etc so to take the time out to sit in a lecture or a class or Q&A session we do appreciate it and we do respect that because we know that it can be very tough and very tight when you're going to school so thank you for that uh, my companion and my friend my uh, elder in Islam brother Abu Saeed for uh, chauffeuring me and taking me and bringing me down here Alhamdulillah for all of that the topic of culture and Islam or worded in a better way Islam and culture is of utmost or the utmost importance the utmost importance in 2018 just like a lecture that we did a couple of days ago at the NJ Dawa conference on social media stung by comparison is something which I feel should be in the forefront of the lectures and the classes and the forums that we have social media and culture and one of the reasons why it's such an important topic and why it's such a dangerous topic is because right now you guys me too but specifically more of you we will call you're in a meat grinder you know what a meat grinder is where they grind up meat a chunk of meat whether it's a uh, steak or red meat or chicken breast or whatever part of the animal it may be and they grind the meat up and that solid chunk of flesh now becomes into smaller pieces or slices minced and they add things and it comes another creation such as a sausage or something which is processed or others you may say a melting pot and once more is something that we say but do we actually understand what's meant by a pot in which things are melted i.e. just like the meat grinder there's something which is solid there is a chunk there is something which is of one essence and it's placed inside of a large metal cauldron and a great amount of heat is applied and another matter or another chunk or another essence is placed in that pot and the heat is so extreme that the solid pieces are no longer solid and those essences of those that matter is now mixed and intertwined and integrated and it's only because of extreme heat just like the meat grinders because of extreme pressure it's broken and ripped and torn and smashed and smushed and then pushed out as something else so this is what all you guys are in as we speak you're in a meat grinder or melting pot of Islam and within Islam there are different orientations there are different dawahs there are different practices there are different roads and ways of navigating inside of Islam and then race nationality color tribes clans families america career getting married and the list goes on of all of the things and different elements that are being thrown and hurled upon you or many of you are throwing and hurling yourself upon them so their lives no doubt that's tough and that's a challenge i have to please allah first and foremost in 2018 in the united states 
There's music, there's alcohol, there are drugs, there are women, there are men, there's drugs, there's so many different things. Riba, interests, looking like a Muslim, making salah on time. I have to please my mother, my father. I have to please my friends. I have to be cool and hip. I don't want no one to look at me like I'm corny, I'm a nut, or I'm square, or I'm a scare, I'm punk, or whatever. And there's so many other aspects that you have on you from the time you wake up until the time when you go to sleep. So that's tough. And that's challenging. And I consider to call this a meat grinder. Huh? How much meat is going to survive that grinding process? That melting pot? What matter? No matter what matter it may be, it could be iron, metal. When that extreme heat is placed on it, how much of it is going to survive and keep its own unique essence and identity of matter? So whether you realize it or not, this is the average situation of the Muslim youth today in general, specifically the Muslim youth that go to college and they're studying things of biology, psychology, and the list goes on or whatever you're studying, whatever you're trying to accomplish, whatever you're trying to do. So with that being said, knowing is half of the So you guys have to realize that it is not easy and it's not going to be easy. And no one promised you that it was going to be easy. Never said that. I don't think so. Rather, your parents will say the opposite. When I came to this country, do you know what I had? Do you know how long it took me to get this? Do you know how much I had to work just for you to go to school? And those of you whose parents are not from another country, as we say indigenous, quote unquote, whether you're black, or whether you're white, or whether you're, as they say, Latino, you come from Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico, whatever the case may be, but specifically black Americans, then white Americans, then Hispanic or Latino Americans, or those that are considered to be the indigenous Muslims, obviously with the black Muslims being the majority. Those who don't come from another country, don't have a heritage or a lineage or a legacy of a foreign land, your father will tell you the same thing. You know, easy, you got it. You know how simple it is now? You know what I had to do, do this? I couldn't go to school, son. It was no school, it was no college. It was work at 14, work at 13, work at 12. I didn't have the ability to play sports and have fun. I had to work to feed your mother so she could give birth to you. We had to fight in the streets. I was in jail. I was locked up. I was incarcerated. I was, I was, and I was just for you to have your comfortable life. So oftentimes our parents, they don't lie to us. But we choose to take it as if they're lying to us. But they tell us the truth. No one promised that it's going to be easy for you, son. If you're trying to hold fast to your Islam and trying to keep your identity as a Muslim and try to be a strong Muslim, that's challenging with keeping your identity with your country and your culture and your race and your lineage and the list goes on. So it's going to be tough, guys. And if it's tough, and if you know that it's tough, and alhamdulillah, as we said, that's half of the battle won right there. Just knowing. Knowing yourself and knowing what you're up against. And there are many of us who do not know ourselves. And if we do know ourselves, we choose to live in a delusional world. We try to live in a fake fantasy world, knowing that I'm not made for this. And this is not me. Or I'm not happy knowing it. But to please our parents, to please our friends, to make people happy, to be accepted, to get along, we act fake. We fake the funk, as we say back in the day. It's a reality. So oftentimes, we don't know who we are. And if we do know, we don't acknowledge it. And there are oftentimes, unfortunately, when we don't know who we are, let alone knowing who our enemy is, who's the other side of combatants. Are we understand that? So this is reality. So knowing is half of it. But knowing isn't enough. After you know, you have to do. And how to do. Alright? So with that being said, guys, there are many challenges that Muslim youth face today. There are many challenges in this college right here, in this building as we speak. And it is upon you to seek Allah's help. It is upon you to ask Allah for support. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ salah. Allah says, and seek help in two things. Prayer and patience, perseverance. That is the key to the successful warrior. And that's what it means to fight and to win, is to outlast, to persevere. Is that your will is stronger than that of the opposing force. Physically, you may not be stronger. Numerically, you may not be stronger. Intellectually, you may not be stronger. But no one is gonna be more patient than me. And we learn this from sports. Some of the most talented athletes will tell you, all right? And let's take for, take, for example, baseball. Some of the most successful baseball players. Once, I believe it was Derek Jeter, was quoted, and he was asked about his success and 
how he became such a legend and your talent and so on and so forth. He said from high school to college, college to the uh, minor leagues, to the major leagues, to winning and to dominating, etc. He says, I've always come across people that were better than me. I've always experienced players that were more talented than I was. He says, but I never found someone that worked harder than I did. So I've never found someone who had a stronger work ethic than me. So he said that you'll find someone all the time who's more talented than you naturally, but it's unnecessary for him to work harder than you. So if you know what you're up against, and you know that the odds are against you, and the deck of cards is stacked against you, then it is your job to try to even those odds the best way you can. And the starting point is the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And seeking help in Allah, with Allah, and through Allah, the mighty and the most high. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Allah says in the Quran, and seek help, seek my help. Seek the help of your Lord with sabr, patience, to outlast. And salat, prayer, once you complain to Allah, and you ask for Allah, and you seek help and guidance from Allah, things are going tough. You're not alone. You're not supposed to be alone. But if you don't know how to and when and why, then you're going to be stuck. And those advantages against you are going to clearly topple you over. So Allah says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ And the Prophet ﷺ, he instilled this in his companions. Those who are young, such as Abdullah ibn Abbas, a young man who was talented, who was ambitious, who was very promising. He says, يَحْفَظْكَ He says, protect Allah, and Allah will protect you. In other words, be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah, and be connected to Allah and with Allah. And Allah will take care of all your worries and all of your troubles. So if Allah is on your side, who can be against you? Allah says, if Allah supports you, no one can defeat you. And if Allah forsakes you, i.e., if Allah leads you to who you are with all of the advantages against you, let alone the enemy within, greed, insecurity, cowardice, fear, anxiety, depression, and all of the problems that human beings have, if Allah leads you to yourself and He's not your ally, then no one can support you. And let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want to go on speaking about this because this in itself is an entire lecture. The concept of odds being against you and the concept of patience and perseverance and outlasting and working harder to someone who's stronger than you or bigger than you or larger than you. So there are many challenges that Muslim youth must face in the United States in 2018. Khair, inshallah. With that being said, uh, I want to read a few things to you regarding culture and regarding customs. Customs and culture. Uh, and we're going to suffice ourselves here with some of the statements of some modern day scholars. Even though in most cases we normally try to stick to the traditional or the classical scholars. But it's a few reasons why I'm sticking with the modern day scholars today. يقول الشيخ السعدي رحمه الله الأصل في العادات الإباحة إلا ما ورد عن الشارع تحريمه وقال الشيخ عبد العزيز بن عبد الله بن باز رحمه الله الواجب على كل مسلم أن لا يعتمد على العادات بل يجب عرضها على الشرع المطهر فما أقره منها جاز فعله وما لا فلا وليس اعتياد الناس للشيء دليلا على حله فجميع العادات التي اعتادها الناس في بلادهم أو في قبائلهم يجب عرضها على كتاب الله وسنة رسوله عليه الصلاة والسلام فما أباح الله ورسوله فهو مباح وما نهى الله عنه وجب تركه وان كان عادة للناس وقال الشيخ بن عثيمين رحمه الله تعالى الآدات لا تجعل غير المشروع مشروع لقوله تعالى وليس البر أن تأتوا البيوت من ظهورها مع أنهم اعتادوه واعتقدوه من البر فمن اعتاد شيء يعتقده برا نعرض على شريعة الله ابن سعدي رحمه الله says الأصل في العادات he says when it comes to customs when it comes to culture meaning what you like to drink alright right now I'm drinking tea you may be drinking spring water you may have an iced coffee. You may have a cappuccino. In your village, you drink fruit juice, papaya, mango, guava, apple, orange. 
In my village, we do this, we do that. What do you like to eat? What do you like to eat? You like American food, soul food? You like Middle Eastern food, West African food, couscous, rice, noodles, soup, lamb, chicken, vegetables? Getting hungry, right? <laughs> uh, I don't want to go in too deep and start actually naming some foods, like specific types, of, specific dishes, right? I'm with him. People around the world, they're different on what they eat. What's on your feet? You're wearing shoes, sneakers, Jordans, boots, mashallah, really nice shoes, all right? Some people like to walk without any shoes, barefoot. I've seen this in Medina. People will never, ever wear shoes. In Yemen, I've seen people walk down the street wearing coats with no shoes on. In New York City here, in Queen, where we live in Queens, there are people who are Sikhs who don't wear shoes no matter how cold it is. Custom, culture, all right? Huh? Damn, right? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Everyone understand this? What color you like to wear? Blue, gray, stripe, pinstripe, polka dot, etc. All right? Where I come from, women get married when they're 16 years old. Where you come from, women get married when they're 14 years old. Where you come from, women get married when they're 18 years old. In my American culture, a woman gets married after she finishes her bachelor's or associate's degree. She's 20, 25, etc. Culture, customs, how people do things. What do you do when you enter someone's house? Do you take off your shoes? Do you take off your hat? Do you bring a gift? What part of the fish do you give the guest? Do you give the guest the filet or the head? Right? Everyone understand this? What do you offer the guest? Where does the guest sit? Nam, do you wash your, your hands before or after? Do you eat dessert first, fruit first, etc. Culture and customs. He says culture and customs, traditions of the people. He says they are originally permissible. And you can do whatever you want to do. Eat whatever you want to eat. Drink whatever you want to drink. Wear whatever you want to wear. Get married however you want to get married. Until there is something from the Quran and the Sunnah to say otherwise. Listen carefully. The rule of thumb, the default, is that culture, custom, tradition is open. Do whatever you want to do. Unless there is an ayah in the Quran or hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, No, you cannot eat rice. You cannot wear blue. You cannot take your shoes off when you enter someone's home. You cannot uh, get married at 18. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Unless we have that, do whatever you wish to do. This is a tremendously beneficial principle in understanding the deen of Islam and understanding the fiqh of Islam. Is that there is no restriction on what you can't do unless there is a restriction on what you can't do. So this proves that Islam has not come to abolish every traditional or cultural practice. And there are people who are zealots, they're extreme. And anything that's from their country, or their city, or their town, or their borough, whatever, they want to get rid of. Do it another way. Dress another way. This is your traditional meal? No, don't eat that no more. You have to eat this. We traditionally wear this color? Don't wear that color anymore. And there's nothing in the Quran and the Sunnah to say, to say otherwise. That's the default. But the default is not always what? The default. Your phone comes with default settings, correct? And you go into the settings and you do what? To how you or what's needed. So the default doesn't always remain the what? But that is the default. Everyone understand this? So that's a starting point. So that's a, that's a law. This, just explaining this one principle in itself is worthy of a workshop. Not a lecture, a workshop. Explaining this principle and how much it can save you from confusion when it comes to getting married. When it comes to going to school, when it comes to wearing hijab, when it comes to who you can and where you can and cannot go, etc. A Sheikh ibn Ubaz, he says, Al wajibu ala kulli muslimin, Allah ya'atamida ala al adat. He says, That which is mandatory, that which is compulsory, obligatory, you have to. He says, Each and every Muslim is not to rely and depend upon customs and cultural practices. Listen carefully to the words. Benefit from them, use them, practice them, isn't the same as al-ya'tamid, to depend. You understand this? is a huge difference. I depend on my culture. My culture is the beginning, the default, and it's the end. My culture is the constitution. There's a huge difference between the two. He says a Muslim is not to depend on cultural practices and customs. He says, بَلْ يَجِبُ عَرْضُهَا عَلَى الشَّرْعِ الْمُطَحَّرِ 
He says, rather, these customs, these cultural practices, these traditions, they must be presented and placed on the scale of the Sharia, the pure Sharia. We benefit from this is that if it was weak, if it's not in the Quran, if it's the view of an Imam or this one and that one, that's not mutaha. That's not the organic deen. So, where I come from, you cannot enter someone's house unless you take off your shoes, for example. And anyone who wears their shoes in the house is disrespectful and rude and nasty. And it shows that it doesn't have any humbleness or humility. That's where I come from, for example. What does the Quran and the Sunnah say about shoes? What does the Quran and the Sunnah say about this and about that? I'm not saying this. Any cultural practice. It has to be placed on the scale of the pure deen. He says, So whatever the Sharia acknowledges, you can keep doing. The Sharia acknowledges for you to take off your shoes. For example, the Sharia acknowledges for a person to get married at a certain age. The Sharia acknowledges a person to get married interracially. It's permissible. And if not, then you can't do it. Even if it's the practice of your fathers, forefathers, ancestors. Everyone in my village does this. Everyone where I come from does this. All of my parents got married like this. But the deen clearly prohibits it. Then it cannot be done. So this is where the challenge begins. Which one are you going to obey now? You're going to obey your father? It's easy to say. It's what? It's easy to say. But when people are hollering at you, screaming at you, threatening you, you're being disrespectful, paradise lies beneath the feet of the mother, a stock for the law, you're shaming your people. It's not that simple. And that's what I said in the beginning of the talk is that you guys are in a melting pot. Fire is hot. And it's easy to say. But when that fire is under you, melting everything around you, only a few people are going to what? Survive. Everyone understand this? Sheikh Rahim al he then says, and just because the people do things and they traditionally practice a thing, it does not mean that it is permissible. And that's a delay that it's permissible. And that's the first thing that oftentimes our parents will say. Everyone's doing it, right? Everybody's doing it. It doesn't mean that it's what? Permissible. Now, when I was growing up, things may be different now. I may feel a little old or outdated. But when I was growing up in school, if you did something wrong, if you put some crowns on a radiator, or you made a paper plane or a paper popper, right? You threw something at somebody. You did something in class. You were a class clown. The teacher pulled you to the side. And they said, why did you throw that? Why did you do that? He said, well, everyone else was doing it. They did it too. They were saying the same thing. They did the same thing I did. And the first thing the teacher says, what? If everybody jumps off a bridge. You understand this? Think about that now. That may come from a non-Muslim teacher. But the principle is there. Just because people are doing something does not mean that it's what? Reasonable. We're not talking about deen. Reasonable and logical. Everyone understand this? Just because people do things, it doesn't mean that it's okay. So just stop and ponder on that now. What did Ibrahim alayhi salam, what argument did he have to do with his people? What did they say? Our forefathers worshipped these idols. Does that mean it's right? Then obviously that's the next point of clash. Because if you say that your forefathers were wrong, that means you're attributing foolishness and ignorance and stupidity to your people. And that's a cardinal sin for a cultural person. So you telling me right here, let me get something straight. You're 25 years old. You're telling me that this sheikh was wrong and this person was wrong for 100 years, 20 years, five, a thousand years our forefathers have been doing this. And you're telling me they're all wrong and you're right? It's difficult. It's what? You can't just say yeah. You're not going to last if you say that. You have to use a bit more wisdom. First and foremost, remove yourself. I'm not saying anything. This is what I learned. Or even better than that, I learned this from the Sheikh at the Masjid. Abi, you can go talk to him. <laughs> Everyone understand this? But the moment you say yes, you're making it a fight between you and 100 or 500 years of history. And that's, you're not going to win that battle. You're not going to what? You're not going to win that battle. But a man may have knowledge. He may be eloquent. He may have more smoothness to you. He may have more hikmah than you. And even if your father doesn't agree, he won't be able to beat him up and bash him like he will you. Everyone understand? Hikmah, wisdom. You understand this, Kalaji? Yes. Hikmah. Putting something in its proper place. Now, wisdom. Ibn Ubaz, he then says, It must be presented to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. 
So whatever Allah and His Messenger makes permissible is permissible. And whatever Allah and His Messenger forbid, it is forbidden even if it's the custom of the people. Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin he says, Customs do not make something which isn't from the religion from the religion. It doesn't work like that. Because Allah Azza wa He clearly prohibited things that were customs or cultural practices of Muhammad's people. The people of Jahiliyyah, the Arabs. They had many things that they did. Superstitions, practices, and Islam did not acknowledge all of them. And one of those practices is what he mentions from Surah Al-Baqarah, in which Allah Azza wa says, Bir, piety, doesn't mean that you enter your home from behind, the back door. That's not piety. Piety is what Allah has explained of belief, of amal, of prayer, of sadaqah, etc. Into the homes, through the front gates, Allah says. So they had a superstition that when you come home, never walk in from the front door. Why did they have this superstition? Where did they get this superstition from? It's not important. But Allah abolished it. It was no longer acceptable. But if the custom was the delim and absolute, then Allah wouldn't have done that. And the same applies to burying their girl daughters. And then this goes on the things that they used to do. And it doesn't mean that everything that the Arabs did, Islam abolished. Because the Arabs, they did many things in which Islam acknowledged, such as kindness to one's guests, such as honor, chivalry. And the list goes on. Shaykh Ibn Uthameen, he then says, uh, even if the people believe something and depend upon it, and they see that it's good in righteousness and piety, it does not mean that it is good and a means of righteousness and piety until it is placed on the what? The scale, the Bible said, the beam, right? How many? <laughs> a scale, a precise measuring scale. Uh huh. Everyone understand this? Of the Kitab and of the Sunnah. So these are words of wisdom from some of the modern day ulama. And I believe that in light of these words, we can understand many of those questions and answers. And I'm sure each one, of, each one of you has ideas floating around in your head right now as we speak about things that you've heard from your parents or your friends or your colleagues or you've seen in a fatwa, etc. So my job is to incite thought. That's it. I can't explain everything. There's no time. If I wanted to, if I was willing to explain everything, there's no time. But my job is to stimulate what? your minds and to start thinking critically. And there's nothing more beneficial for a Muslim youth in 2018 than critical thought. It's to actually break it down and start thinking about today, about yesterday, and about tomorrow. So with that being said, let's get started with the questions. Insha'Allah ta'ala, Jazakum Allahu Khairan. The first question is, how would you suggest to go about creating an environment in which you are able to speak and have difficult but necessary conversations with your parents? Question says, how to go about and creating an environment in which a person can speak and discuss about difficult issues with one's parents or with one's parent. Something which is difficult but necessary. First and foremost is seek help with Allah, like we explained. It's to ask Allah to make you strong. Ask Allah to give you courage. And ask Allah to put the truth upon your tongue in a smooth and understandable manner. Because not always what you say, but oftentimes what? How you say it, or when you say it. You don't go and you talk about some life-changing decision when your father comes home from 14 hours of work. It's not necessarily the wisest thing to do. Or when he's waking up, or going to sleep, or leaving the house. You have to pick up time, and you have to pick how to say it. And rather, there may be a time in which you shouldn't say anything, and let someone else say it. Talk to your uncle, who you have a closer relationship with than your father. It's a reality. Or your uncle, he may be more open-minded. Not as now minded. Or you, let's say, for, for argument's sake, you may have an uncle who's liberal and doesn't practice his land that much. But he has a way with your father. He may be older than your father, younger than your father. He can talk to him. So you may have to get it across in a message through somebody else. So you don't necessarily always have to create the environment. Are we understand this? And if you do wish to create the environment, you have to pick a time, a place, and a way. And this is all summed up in hikmah, wisdom. You may ask your father or your mother for something, they may say no. You ask them in another way, at another time, in a different style, they say of course. So you have to have wisdom. And that's why young men and young women should learn wisdom. Learn how to be wise and start working on it now. 
there's some people who are naturally smooth by birth, naturally wise, and they learn things and it makes them even wiser, wiser. But if you don't know, you have to learn. Secondly is you don't necessarily have to create the environment or go to someone else. Oftentimes allow the environment to create itself, quote unquote. Metaphorically speaking, no one, nothing creates itself, all right? Of course, but we're not living in a time of a course. We're living in a time in which you said this, you said that, and uh, he's attributing creation to other than Allah. We're not living in a time in which people can use common sense and good thoughts of their brothers. All right, you understand this? So sometimes a lot of situations present itself. Sometimes you shouldn't talk about it. And maybe your parents, they'll bring it up. Maybe they'll ask you or leave them a sign. There is no one rule. It depends on your parents. And also it depends on you and how much respect your parents give you. And it depends on what type of child you are, what type of son or daughter you are. Are you respectful? Are you responsible? All right. How long have you been righteous and pious and practicing? All right. You have to be mindful of all of these different things. So that's what I would say in brief with regards to the first question and all those best. Okay, so the second question is, how do you approach conversations pertaining to mental health in a culture in which it is taboo? It's a good question. Sorry, how to approach conversations pertaining to mental health in a culture in which it is taboo? Just like the previous question, and just like anything else which is uncomfortable or something which is taboo, such as questions that pertain to one's sex life. Are you sexually active? You want to get married? Do you have a girlfriend? This is a reality. This is not a joke. This is real. In which this is totally terrible. Hmm? You may have a problem. You may have an issue growing up, going to college. This is real. So anything which is uncomfortable and taboo, it goes back to the previous or the previously mentioned principles, time, place, how, etc. What's important is wisdom is not always the best thing to do. Sometimes you have to be blunt. And sometimes you have to be straight up and just bismillah. They're sitting around, eating their morning breakfast, drinking their tea. Dad, I got married. Or, <laughs> exactly. But guess what just happened? Tell me one thing that just happened. I got everybody's what? Attention. Immediately. Everyone understand this? Immediately. Abby, I'm getting married tomorrow. You may not be getting married tomorrow. I'm not saying that you're going to lie. But I'm saying something hypothetical. Sometimes blunt and direct is the best way to be. When things are so hush hush taboo, everyone understand this, and that's because the louder you are and the blunter you are, the more embarrassing it is for them. Everyone understand this, and if the odds are against you, you sometimes have to force them to engage you. Everyone understand this, or am I? Uh, I will say I think this may be what too much. All with him is that sometimes be blunt. Don't always try to smooth it out. Just go right, make it uncomfortable and awkward as possible. And you force them to bring it to the surface. As far as if it's an issue which isn't that, that taboo, then that's a different story. With regards to wisdom and the perfect time and place. But we're talking about something which people never ever talk about. The best way of doing it is what? Sometimes to do what? Is to just be blunt, go right to the point. And there's no introduction needed. huh? And that applies to mental health. Or any other issue, like I said, one's sex life, interracial marriage, whatever the issue is, huh? And the Lord knows best. Okay, so our third question is, what is the third question? How do you respectfully challenge the cultural boundaries set for you as a woman while still upholding some cultural values? I can explain the question for you a bit if you'd like. Basically, um, maybe like that. Maybe like I get it, but if you okay. want to, it's no problem. No, because um, we were talking about it as a group yesterday, and a lot of the issues came up in terms of, in culture, they expect certain things of you as a woman, but, you know, with American culture, you go to school, you have aspirations, you have ambitions, and some of those things, like, directly conflict with what cultural boundaries are already set for you as a woman. And so the idea is once you get married, you know, your life ambition kind of stops, and it transfers over to your married life. And a lot of us have issues with dealing with that. How do you have those conversations? You know, do you, are you blunt? Crystal clear. Okay. Crystal clear. Tight right. question says, how do you respectfully challenge the cultural boundaries set for you as a woman while still upholding some cultural values? Before getting to the answer, I have some problems with the actual question. I have some problems with the question. First is, it says respectfully challenge. As I previously explained, sometimes you have to respectfully challenge 
And sometimes you have to challenge something without respect. Sometimes. Because there are certain cultural values which are totally, totally bad and negative. And they're not from Islam, nor are they from common sense. They have no place of value. Everyone understand this? Not all, but some cultural practices which go against Islam and go against what? Common sense. So there is no respect. You only give respect to your parents for they, as parents. And you give respect to certain issues that need to be discussed in a certain light. But something which is clear falsehood. Oftentimes, respect, you shoot yourself in the foot by offering respect because you're adding fuel to their fire that is existing and that's been burning for so many years. Everyone understand this? So that's the first point with the question. Not all, once more, not all, but what? Some. There are certain things in which you cannot respectfully challenge. Certain customs, you have to just challenge them. Everyone understand this? That's first and foremost. Secondly is the cultural boundaries set for you as a woman. Next point, in which I differ, all cultural boundaries set for women are not necessarily bad. They're not necessarily negative. Nor are all of them necessarily haram and against this land. And when we talk about doing away with culture and a person becoming open-minded and moderate and progressive and liberal, oftentimes it's something which is negative. And this cultural norm, obviously for men as well, but obviously we're talking about women, that's in the question, it may be a good thing. It's a good thing, whether it's a restriction, an expectation, or a limit or a boundary. Just because something is a boundary doesn't mean that it's bad. Listen, guys, many people, they go extreme, and they say we have to get rid of the boundaries. That's not true. There are certain boundaries that are needed for your protection and well-being. You play football, there's a what? There's a what? There's an out of bounds. There's an end zone. There's yardage. These boundaries, these markings are made for the game. It can't just be in which you can run 500 yards without no boundaries. That doesn't mean that. So get rid of that thinking that all cultural boundaries are bad. Like we just said, everything from culture isn't negative. And everything from your culture isn't necessarily against this land. Everybody understand this? And we have to clarify this. Now, oftentimes, the difficult part comes in in which we have the value, the core of the value is good. And it's from Islam, but it's surrounded and wrapped in some type of falsehood. It's too extreme on the outside, but the core is a good thing. I would understand this. I would understand this. So you have to be mindful of that. Moving forward, it says here, while still upholding some cultural values, like I just said, some cultural values are not to be upheld and others are. So therefore, how do you know which are, which aren't, except through knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, like I just explained in the introduction. You don't know what's good, what should I keep with my culture from Yemen, or from West Africa, or from Bangladesh, or from Palestine, or what has to be removed and discarded, unless you have some type of basic what? Knowledge. Knowledge of principles, say cool, right? And knowledge of actual issues is issues themselves. I understand the difference. And if you don't have that knowledge, at least have the ability and the humility and the respect to con someone, con contact one of knowledge. I understand this. To contact one of what? Of him and ask them specifically. So all cultural values aren't bad, just like all of them aren't good. As far as those which are bad and need to be challenged, how do you go about and doing it in a respectful manner? It depends on your relationship with your parents once more. How do your parents look at you? Are they willing to listen to you or you're just wasting your time? There are different levels, different, different cultures. Some people are more stubborn and more pig at it than others. Some people are more open than others. Some parents are more respectful than others. I would understand this. At the end of the day, make sure that you give yourself a good amount of padding and insulation. A good amount of padding and insulation. Abby, you know I love you. And you know I would never do anything to go against you if I had the choice not to. And you know that I'm a good son and that I love you. You know this. There's nothing more that I want except to make you happy. However, Abby, I can't do this because I learned that it's haram. I can't do this because I clearly read in the Quran that we can't do this. It's impermissible to, to, to treat women like this. The Quran clearly says that. Are we understanding this? So give yourself extra what? Padding and insulation. And obviously, oftentimes, 
the parents aren't necessarily going to listen. They may not listen. They may say, no, you're still disobeying me. You can't disobey me. But if you've given yourself extra padding, when the force comes, you can what? You can bear the force of, of the attack. Everyone understand this? It's going to hurt, but you can minimize it. And you've made it clear. And most importantly, brothers and sisters, is let your actions speak louder than your words. But not necessarily always speak to them. Your character. If you have problems with disrespecting your parents and not treating them kindly and benevolently and obeying them, they don't ma it doesn't matter what you say. And the first thing they're going to say against you is, is that well, what happens to Quran and Sunnah, Deen al Haq, as they say, when you're disrespectful to me. So if you're not living right, then you automatically have a what? Your position is automatically what? It's automatically what? Compromised. If you're not, if you're not a good parent, if you're not a good child. If you're not a good son and a good daughter. Alright? So be respectful. Give yourself extra padding. Make dua for them. Try your best. If it's not obligatory, if it's not haram, try your best to do it. But if you're in a situation in which they're asking to do something which is against Islam, or it's something that's going to make you totally miserable, then you have to try your best and it's going to be a fight. And just ask them one critical question. Abby, would you like to see your daughter... That you raised and taught and all of the money that you spent on my education. Would you like to see your daughter happy and successful going against the custom and the tradition? Or would you like to see me miserable and depressed going with the tradition? And then leave, walk away. Ask you that question. Just ask them that one question. Ask them that one question, seriously. And let's make an example of... A, a perfect, and I'm not keep trying to dwell on this situation, but it is a serious situation, interracial marriages. The formality, the custom is that not only race, but you have to marry someone in your family, a cousin, a long distance. What would you, what would you want to see, Abby? Me happy, happy grandchildren going against the custom or miserableness and unhappiness and him beating me up and divorce, but as long as the formality is there and didn't walk away. There's not a sensible parent that's going to disagree with that. Even if he doesn't say yes. But you've made a successful, what? Move against his, his, his psyche. I would understand this. So that's what I would say. And Allah knows best. I'm going to move on to a question down the line because a lot of them have already answered. Um, limitations with in-laws and cousins. In the culture, a lot of times we're used to interacting with cousins and in-laws, and if you refuse to do so, you're isolated or you're blacklisted. How would you, what advice do you have to start implementing just the regular rules that are there for interaction between, you know, the different genders and family? Clear. Limitations with in-laws and cousins, how do you start imp to implement these? Um, it's going to be a challenge. And oftentimes, why it's a challenge is because... Many of us weren't practicing from the get-go. We weren't on the sunnah from the get-go. We didn't know about the pious predecessors in their way from the get-go. We didn't know about hadith from the get-go. Or if we knew about it, we were just living in our little, what they say, people say small jahiliya, a bubble of jahiliya. You had tattoos, you had a girlfriend, you were smoking and drinking and listening and bopping and hopping and so on and so forth. And then you got into a car accident, or you made a hajj or umrah, or somebody got shot or stabbed. Something happened to you to wake you up. You walked by the masjid that day. That brother grabbed you. Hey man, listen, why you got on that? Why don't you wear this? So on and so forth. And you became enlightened. Allah guided you. And then all of a sudden you make that magical transformation. You went from dressing like this with tattoos and this and that. To thaw and a beard. Making fudger in the morning. Coming home late because you had Isha at a class. I can't eat that meat. I only eat the halal meat now. You stop listening, you stop. Your life changes. This is a reality among many of us. Your life changes, right? So now your parents are expecting the normal, simple, basic son or daughter that they had. But now I can't shake your hand to this one. And I can't go to this birthday party. And I can't do that. And I'm not going out. And I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not. So that's a problem. So the best way of taking any problem like this is with gradual, progressive dawah. Do not come home. Yesterday you were in the club, and today you're in the masjid, everything's haram. Everything's bid'ah. You're all going to the fire of hell. There's many people, they say this. And if they don't say this with their tongues, they say it with their actions. Pay attention, guys. Pay attention. You may not necessarily say it with your tongue, 
but your actions prove that's what you believe about them. And your father and your mother and your little brother, they say just yesterday he was chasing girls. Now we're all sinners and we're all going to burn in Jahannam forever. That's a problem. That's a problem. What is the ruling on this act that your parents are making? It's haram, no doubt. And it is a means of going to the fire of hell. But it doesn't mean that you have to say that in 0 to 60 at breakneck speed. It doesn't mean that you go from sinner to saint overnight and everyone else has to make that transformation like that. So even though the rules never change and you're trying and you're different now, how you interact with people, what you say to them has to be done progressively. Has to be done what? Progressively. So let's say you have a cousin or a family friend that's not related to you. He's not a mahram. Your sister or a woman. She's friend. She watched you grow up, but she's not related to you. And she sees you and says, ha ah. She wants a great big old hug. And you know that you can't touch her. But you may not have the strength to tell her that. It may be a really embarrassing moment. It may happen so quick, so rapidly, that it becomes extremely awkward. And it's going to cause a major rift. So, the rules don't change. The haram is haram. But in this situation, you may have to suck it up. And you may have to give her a hug. To avoid that major problem that you know you can't handle. And then later on, you talk. And you explain and you discuss. But if you have the knowledge, if you have the courage, if you don't care, then tell her. Break her heart in front of everybody. <laughs> but know for sure that you're going to have to what? Deal with it later on. And the first finger that's going to be pointed is not that it's haram to touch someone that is in your mahram, is that you're an extremist. That's the first finger that's going to be pointed towards you. And as I said, the, the, the cards are not stacked in your favor. So you have to use some type of wisdom now. You have to use some type of wisdom now. And I'm not saying that the halal is haram and the haram is halal. I've never said that. What? I never what? The rules don't change. We've never said that. But the application, you have to be mindful of this. And you may have to have suffered upon some of your past sins. Because you, are, you always weren't like that. You didn't always wear a thob. You were drinking and smoking and coming home high. Some of those sins may haunt you. Or even if you weren't smoking and drinking and getting high, you were just like everybody else, wearing tight jeans, tight shirt with your hair out. And now you have one hijab. Do you think that those sins are just going to go away and vanish overnight? Everyone understand this? And it doesn't make an excuse for your parents not to follow the truth. And this is one of the things that we benefit from Musa's story, alayhi salam, with Fir'aun. That's the first thing that Pharaoh said to him. Just yesterday, weren't you a boy in my house? Just yesterday, didn't you kill? Just yesterday, weren't you, weren't you, weren't you, weren't you? And notice how Musa, alayhi salatu salam, he never differed and fought with Fir'aun on those points. The Quran, Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah Al-Qasas, it doesn't say that Musa said, I was never in your house. He never denied the fact that he killed a man. He never denied the fact of these things. Never. But he only dealt with the present and the future. Allah blessed me. Allah made me from the messengers. Allah guided me. I did it and I was astray. I did it and I was this. So use wisdom once more. And most importantly, do not deal with specifics. Well, son, are we all going to the fire of hell if you don't take your interpretation of Islam? Many of us will say, yes, you are. If you don't take it, if you don't understand the fatwa that I read. No. Allahu alam. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to paradise. I don't have no guarantee, but I do tell you that I'm striving. And if the Prophet ﷺ told the man, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ or قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ فُلْ مَسْتَغِلْ Say, I believe in Allah, and then physically be steadfast and upright. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not judging you, even though there is judgment in Islam. But I, that's not my place, because yesterday I had a girlfriend. So it's not my place to become the world judge of the whole family. La, 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 la. But if you ask me, I'll tell you, you can't have a girlfriend in this haram. Wisdom and avoid that which is strong. Avoid that which is bigger and larger than you. Everyone understand this? And if you don't, like we said, in most cases, not only will they not respect you, but you may push them away from accepting the sunnah. Everyone understand this? So that's the best thing that I would say. And Allah knows best. Obviously, you tell them. I'm sorry, you tell them. You know, you know I love you guys. This lady, she was closer to me than my actual blood on. No, not about that. And I'm not denying that. And I do care about you and love you as a family friend. But I love Allah and I care about Allah more. And it's nothing personal. Please don't take it personal. And it may hurt. It may hurt her. 
It may be some injury to have that old family friend, he can't hug you. I, I love you, but haram is haram. Everyone understand this? And most importantly, remove yourself from the situation. I was taught that it's haram. The sheikh at the masjid told me it's haram. But the moment you take on the argument, they're going to say, you don't know anything. And oftentimes, you may not know that much. And Allah knows best. The next question is, <clears throat> If you obtain your parents' anger upon something that they shouldn't be angry about, will you be punished to some degree because they are in fact upset with you? That can include marrying someone that they didn't want you to marry, college choice, things of that nature. Sorry. It says both for men and, men, men and women, common practice. If you obtain your parents' anger upon something that they shouldn't be angry about, will you be punished in marrying some, I, such as marrying someone they don't agree with, college choice, etc.? Not necessarily, no. No. If it's something that is all right, so this this is the bottom the bottom line, guys. There are three categories, all right. Here, one, two, three, all right. Here we have customs that Islam has clearly acknowledged. Here we have customs that Islam has clearly abolished, and here we have customs that Islam has said nothing about. There is no hadith for it or against it. So the first category, you must obey your parents. And if you disobey your parents in this, you are sinful. And you're deserving of Allah's punishment. If that pertains to going to school, college, marrying, etc. The second category, if your parents tell you to do it, and it's haram, and you obey them, you are sinful. And you deserve to be punished. The third category, if your parents tell you to do it or not to do it, you should listen to your parents. It's not a sin or a reward in doing it. Because the act hasn't been spoken about in Islam. You understand this? If your mother says to you, I want you to wear navy blue. Don't wear black abaya. What should you do? Wear navy blue. There is no hadith saying what color you cannot, cannot wear as a Muslim. It's just an example. You understand this? But the hadith says women should not wear navy blue. Don't listen to your parents. The hadith says women must wear navy blue. And you want to wear black, you have to do what? Wear navy blue like your parents say. So if your parents are trying to get you to do something that is haram, that's not an issue of discussion. If they're telling you to do something which is obligatory, it's not an issue of what? Discussion. If it's open, it's best to go with your parents. But if you feel differently, try to talk to them. Try to discuss with them. But sometimes you have to just suck it up as I said and take one for the team. You don't think your mother made no sacrifices for you? You don't think she wanted to do this and wanted to do that and you were crying and hungry and cold? You don't think your Abby was tired from working all of those hours and you came and says, Abby, pick me up, put me on your back, give me a piggyback ride. You don't think that they, 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 they didn't do things just to please you? So oftentimes we forget and this is what Allah Azzawajal brings our attention to about man. That man was made from base fluid. And all of a sudden, فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ He's an open enemy to us. And just yesterday, you were what? Nothing. So we forget about that now. You're big and you're strong and you're fly and you're smart and you have your little money, your little car, you have your little account. But your father worked hard to make you happy. Your father had to get, he had to, he had to lose work to take you to the hospital, to talk to your parents, to get you out of trouble. He had to do things that he didn't want to. So how can you be so ungrateful and so wretched that you can't repay the favor at least once? And then many of us, we fight with our parents every single occasion we get. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go here. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't I want to be this. I want to, I want to, I want to. Sometimes, maybe, but every single time. So just think about that. How would you like people to treat you? All right? And anyone who's here, if you ever had children, maybe some brothers and sisters have children. If you have children, you know about what I will say? Sacrifice. It's not about what you want. It's about what makes your child happy and what's beneficial for the child. Everyone understand this? So the same has to apply when you get older to make them happy as long as it's not pertaining to the halal and the haram and as long as it's not an issue in which your parents are just totally dominating everything and micromanaging everything because you are grown. So the last thing I want to say about this answer is parents need help and they need therapy too. They have to, you have to understand that. Just like they have to deal with teenagers, cope with teenagers, you have to, you need help too as a parent. 
Your son is 18 now. He's not eight. It's hard. And oftentimes people get stuck. My little small baby boy is not a baby boy anymore. It was so simple back in the day. Come on, son. We're going to go. I need. I want to go play basketball, Abby. Nothing personal against you. I want to hang out with my friends. He has to. He needs help too. He needs therapy as well. So all of us need this. And that's why the Prophet said, I think I'm the religion is nasiha, and included in nasiha is therapy. So it's a fitna for everybody. It's not just about the child, it's not just about the parent. Everyone understand this? And Allah knows best. The next question is, um, it's a common practice in some cultures where men marry their first wife for the sake of their parents and then the second wife for their own sake. Um, we just wanted to know, like, how permissible is that? <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> or, like, if there's a different way to go about it, because the same way women go through the pressures, guys, guys go through the pressures as well. Clear. With regards to a common practice, men met for many, it says men marry first. <laughs> this is going to be a rough one, right? I'm say and for some reason, I feel that I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble with one of you in this answer. It says, many men marry first person for their, for their parents and second person for themselves. Is that permissible? How to refrain from such activity? Once again, we have a full cup of the question. Who said that you have to refrain from this? Who said that that's haram or disliked? All right. But this question is based off of 20 other issues. And the first issue is polygamy or polygyny. And if we, just to be upfront and to keep it real, as we say, keep it 100, right? They say, how many brothers today actually are going to take more than one wife, Abu Sa'id? <laughs> of all the brothers here in this room, how many would you say? What would be the percentage? No, I don't need to pick. None. <laughs> Not even a brother sit next to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, subhanAllah. I thought you said you wanted to be on the Sunnah, Yaqi. <laughs> you didn't say you want to be on the Sunnah. <laughs> SubhanAllah The truth comes out huh? <laughs> Polygamy um, As we've spoken on in detail We've done, we've done a, a, many videos on this topic uh, Is a long 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 discussion Alright A long discussion The bottom line of the discussion Is that it's from the deen If you accept it Then alhamdulillah And if you don't accept it Then that's your problem That's the bottom line you can say whatever you want to say. It was for the time and the prophet and the Arabs and people didn't live that long and women would give birth and they would die in 2018. And whatever you want to say. People abuse it. The brothers aren't right. Whatever you want to say. The bottom line is it is ayah tutlaf fi kitabillah. It's a verse in the Quran that is recited until the end of time which Allah takes the Quran back from his servants. Bottom line. So, before we even talk about polygamy or polygyny, you have to check yourself as a Muslim. Sister says, I accept it, I don't accept it. Who gave you a choice? <laughs> no, this is serious. This is serious. Regardless of the implementation, of, but who said that you have a choice to even make that statement? What happened to Samina wa Atana? Ghufranaka. Oh Allah, we hear, we obey, forgive us. So, we have a serious problem today. In light of politics, in light of Western society, in light of Muslim countries being colonized and their minds being colonized, we have to be mindful of this, guys. That's first and foremost. But the bottom line is, and the bottom reality is that many brothers, if not most brothers today, for one reason or another, are not going to get married to more than one wife. So if that's the case, we don't even necessarily have to deal with it that much. Because the, those who take on more than one wife, a small minority. As far as brothers who do plan on doing it, then we have to ask ourselves the question, why does a man get married? In light of the Qur'an and Sunnah, in the reality of life, or in light of romance, and Disney, and Hollywood? This is a reality. Many people, they say, or they may have the idea that marriage and love must be there. It has to go hand in hand. You can't get married unless you love, you can't love unless you're married. And there are others who may say, Muslim and non-Muslim, they say that it's not a must. It should be that way. You should love the person that you're married to, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. Because there are other reasons and wisdoms why people get what? Married, such as? Huh? Money. Well, not, thank you for keeping it, for keeping it real. Thank you. 
Be honest. Some people get married for what? Status. Beauty. What else? How about children? How about alliances and connections? Protection. These are realities. Papers. No doubt about that. So the bottom line is, if you sat down a hundred people that were married and you asked them, who from among you is actually happy and loves their spouse? You'd be shocked at the numbers that you get. You would be shocked. And that's why in the movies and the cartoons and the novels, the greatest thing is true love. The rarest thing is what? Actual real what? Not for my money or my looks or for this or for that, but love me for who I am. That proves in itself is that marriage doesn't always mean that there's going to be what? Love. So therefore, if a man marries a woman and he doesn't love that woman, or he's not attracted to that woman, he doesn't have no desire for that woman, but it makes his parents happy. And as long as he's not oppressing that woman and wronging her, and he gives her her basic rights, then that will prove the ruling of doing that. That will prove the what? The ruling of doing that. But how many men can do this? How many men can objectively marry somebody and not oppress them and not wrong them? How possible is that? People wrong and oppress people that they love. They do wrong to a woman that they love with all of their heart. Let alone someone who says, I never liked you from day one. I only married you to make my mother happy. What's the chance of him marrying this woman and not wronging her? Everyone understand this? So therefore, the answer has to be taken in light of what we previously explained. Getting married, treating your wife kindly. What of the three categories is it? With regards to your parents, do you have to listen to them? Is it haram to listen to them? Or is it unprescribed? You can get married for your parents' pleasure and still treat her kindly, respectfully, and at least give her her basic rights. Everyone understand this? Do we understand that friendship, love, all of these things sometimes are luxuries in relationships? A brother, he says, I want a special relationship with you as a teacher. Who said that I have to take you as a friend? Who said that? <laughs> Who said that I have to be your friend? My job is to teach you. That's it. A father, he may say to his son, I don't have to be your friend, son. You have a bed to sleep on, a roof over your head, shoes on your feet. My job is done. That's not the best way. We're not recommending that, but that's the reality of life. And the bitter reality is sometimes that applies even to what? Marriage. As long as I do right by you, that's it. Now, who wants this? Is that right? Would I want that for my daughter? That's not the point. It's not about emotions. It's about reality. What's important is, is that the parents should not force their child to marry someone that they don't want to marry. That's the bottom line. You try to give a suggestion. You try to come up with an idea. We think she's a good girl for you, so on and so forth. It'll make us happy. That's one thing. But don't force your child to marry someone that he or she doesn't what? want to marry. So therefore, everyone should sit down with respect, being reasonable, being logical, and talk about it. And maybe you have to make 10% sacrifice. And maybe your parents may have to make 15% sacrifice. You may have to sacrifice beauty for character, character for beauty, age, try to make your parents happy. But don't think you're going to have your cake and eat it too. That's the bottom line in life. You're going to have to make some type of sacrifice unless you want your parents to be eternally upset at you. And this is going back to the what? The meat grinder and the what? The melting pot. And Allah knows best. That's what I'll say. And this have a joab mukhtasar. This is in brief. This is what? This is in brief. Not a full detailed discussion. Allah knows best. So our last question. Um, I'm going to combine the two. It just has to do with a lot of the brothers um, are sent back home usually to study Quran and studies and learn more but the way they're sent back is not always the best way they're sent back and when they come back they haven't finished high school so they don't have you know high school diploma or they're just or they're just not prepared to deal with like worldly issues in terms of a job higher education if they choose to and so what are your words of advice um, I'm going to add to that, basically, a lot of times when they're sent back, especially to schools in Africa, the way in which they're treated is horrible. They're starved, they're beaten to learn, you know, certain things, 
And so a lot of brothers would just like some advice on how to deal with that because, you know, being forced to learn something or anything in that condition can make you, you know, hate. Traumatized, yes, clear. Exactly. Okay, the question says, in brief, there are certain people, certain brothers, certain sisters, or specifically brothers when they're sent back home to learn Islam or to learn the Quran or learn Arabic, to become an alim or mufti or maulana, etc. Even if it's for a short period of time, they're oftentimes traumatized. They get beaten, starved, they get mistreated really, really harsh, harshly. And then they come back, they can't adjust, job, life, college, marriage, etc. What advice could you give? I would say, Deeds are based off of intentions. And this is a harsh reality that we, once again, we have to face. And the question goes to the parents. Why are you sending your son back to your country? Why are you sending your son to Mali? Because you want him to learn the Quran and benefit from it and get closer to Allah and teach Muslims here in the United States? Or are you sending your son back to Mali to say, my son's Hafiz Quran? My son is Hafiz. My son is Alim. My son is a technical engineer and he's Alim of Deen. There lies no doubt, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, we fall into the second category. We only want our children to learn the deen or certain aspects from the deen. Because learning the Quran is a beautiful thing, but it's not the whole deen. Just to show off. And just to be seen and to be heard. And the cultural problems that we have, if you think that they're left back home in your parents' country of origin, they can live in the dream world. The Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean is not enough space for the jahiliyyah that is embedded in the blood and the flesh, unfortunately. Don't think that it's just going to go away because you're in New York City. No, 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 no. It don't work like that. So the point is, why are you sending your son overseas? The Quran is going to help him be a good Muslim. It's going to make him smarter in school, etc. It's going to teach him character, respect for your teacher. And that's a good thing. Even if you got to get beat a little bit. Even if. Even what? Even if, as a brother I had, older brother, he was a martial arts instructor, and he had us in his basement one night, and we were practicing with a bow and an arrow, and doing some things, he's showing, showing us some things. And he wanted to show us some of his artifacts, old weapons and things that he had when he was studying in Japan. And he showed us a stick that was bent and taped up and wrapped up. He said, you see that stick right there? He said, when I was in Japan, he says, the people were terribly racist and prejudiced against me. It was a black brother. And he says, I had nothing to do the color of my skin. It was the sheer fact that I wasn't Japanese. And if you weren't Japanese, they're studying and learning, they treated you a certain way. And you go to the dojo, and you're learning this and you're learning that, the smallest, slightest excuse for them to physically discipline, they would do it. Let alone the fact, he said, of the culture of the people of strict iron discipline and no disrespect to your teacher. He says, do you know, you see, you see how worn down that stick is? He says, they went through countless sticks on my back when I didn't do it right or I didn't work hard enough or I talked back or I was rude or sarcastic. He said, they broke back sticks on my back over and over again. He says, but I never ever quit. And as much as they beat me, they begin to respect me more and more because I was doing well and I was strong. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of this dramatic story is that for him to know these martial arts and to teach students and to have his own dojo and to have all of the benefits that come from martial arts, he had to what? He had to do what? No. <laughs> these guys didn't get the story. He had to get what? He'd get beat. That's the bottom line. So the point I'm trying to make is getting beat is not always the what? The worst thing in the world. Not saying that you should want someone beating you. Everyone understand the point I'm trying to get to? Yeah. Is that you have to give something to get something. So do you think, now we're not discussing is it okay to beat somebody? Is it all right? Is that from the sunnah? That's not on the table of discussion. I'm trying to make a point. Is that you think you're going to become a half of the Quran and learn Arabic and all this ill, sitting, drinking, coffee, eating donuts? Do you think it's just going to come on a bed of roses? No. It comes with some type of what? Sacrifice. And some type of hardship. So the message to the parents is, don't send your son or daughter overseas to learn unless you really want them to learn and benefit. 
Do not send them to show off and to be seen and to be heard. That's number one. That's the first piece of advice. And the second piece of advice, if you went somewhere and you were traumatized and they did mistreat you, that's unfortunate, but nothing comes for free. Everyone understands nothing comes for what? For free. So what do you think is more beneficial in his life now or more harmful? Him getting hit with those sticks as a grown man or him learning all of those different types of martial arts? Of course. Everyone understand this? So it's not the end of the world, guys. Al-Muhim is that the parents should be mindful. The teachers should be mindful. You should not mistreat your student. There has to be discipline. There has to be respect. But it doesn't mean that you have to physically beat somebody like an animal. It doesn't mean that you have to break a stick on someone's back. It doesn't mean that you have to holler and scream and shriek at someone to discipline them and for them to be a good student. Islam is based off of balance. And if you do go through a hardship and you do go through some rough, turbulent times, look at the bigger picture. Look at the what? The bigger picture. And what is the virtue of learning the Quran? And if you think that it's going to come for free without no scratches and bumps and nicks and cuts, then you should turn on your alarm clock. Because you're living in a dream world. In the American society, you can't be a successful lawyer or doctor or engineer unless you go through struggle and sacrifice. You watch people play sports, right? You watch, you listen to musicians. You listen to 